the 28th of September, 1925, Pike County, Kentucky, United States of America. It was one of the darkest days for any genuine sincere Jehovah's Witness. Not because any order was signed to ban Jehovah's Witnesses' activities, neither are there any reports of any witness being detained into a concentration camp. No. This was the date which born one of the most obscure characters in the history of Jehovah's Witnesses' organization. Theodore Jarach, usually addressed as Ted Jarach, but known in the Brooklyn Bethel inner circles as Darth Vader. Why a person like him would have such reputation? What sort of conduct he embarked, which resulted in being feared but never respected? Well, we don't know a lot about his early years. We know that he was raised by three aunts, that he had one sister, several nieces and nephews. According to the Jehovah's Witnesses magazine The Watchtower, he was baptized in 1941 by the age of 15, and that he started pioneering two years later. In 1945 he attended the seventh class of the Watchtower School of Gilead, a special college specifically created to give special training to missionaries sent all over the world. Initially he was assigned as circuit overseer in Cleveland, in the state of Ohio, however that assignment was just a standby for a higher rank position than Nathan Knorr. The then president of the Watchtower Society was reserving for him. Once Theodore Jarach was already a Freemason, Knorr wanted him as overseer of the Australian branch. As soon his paperwork was ready, Jarach was shipped to Australia and started his new job in 1951. However, his stay in the outback lasted less than five years. Why? Well, if we pay attention to the words of Barbara Anderson, former writer and researcher for the Watchtower Society, we will see that the lack of spiritual and human qualities in Jarach resulted in easily getting himself in trouble. Let's hear it directly from her. Uh, uh, Barry, Lloyd Barry, many years before, he was the overseer of the, of the uh, Japanese branch. And it was, this was in the mid-50s. And Ted Jarris was the overseer of the Australian branch. Mm -hmm. And something happened with Ted Jarris, and he uh, was removed from his position as overseer and moved to California, mm -hmm. told to go to California. And the uh, accusations against him are not out there, but it was Nor who had Lloyd Berry come from Japan to investigate, so Lloyd knew what it was, recommended his removal. In the years, many, many years later, I was informed that Ted Jarris was removed from molestation. Okay, now we know, but molestation of who? An adult or a minor? Let's read the following report which we received from a source. There is very good evidence that Noor had removed Jarach as a branch overseer in Australia for some sort of sexual misconduct with a minor. Which is the smoking gun for his attempts to hide the mention of child abuse from the Jehovah's Witnesses rank and file, both in print and in the handling of such matters. This means that just like Leo Greenlee's on our previous video, Theodore Jarach was also a paedophilian. Being a Freemason also protected him from disfellowshipping, or at least disqualification. He was removed from the Australian branch mostly because of the scandal that had blown up, not his sort of punishment. But the question which follows is, did Ted Jarach repent of such sinning conduct? Did he amend himself at all? Well, let's first check what happened after this incident. After his removal from the Australian branch, Ted Jarach was sent by Nathan Knorr to California. 
Within six months he got married to Melita Lasco, a Canadian pioneer and moved temporarily to her hometown in Vancouver. Then, he were assigned to California as circuit overseer until was given him the entire state of California as district overseer. And that's where things gone wrong again. Let's read the following report. On the 27th of September 2002, Ted Jarach was accused of molesting Pat Gaza when she was a little girl in the 50s. Here is her statement. I'm Pat Gaza. And I'm here to say that I was raped by Theodore Jarach when I was a little girl, in the city of Los Angeles. He was a district overseer at that time. There are two boys, their initials are MD and MW. If they could be found they could confirm my allegations. If I could find them, they are older than me, they were there, they were witnesses. We were terrified and silenced. We were not allowed to talk. My life was threatened and my brothers were threatened. They were going to be killed if I spoke. I'm Pat Garza. And I'm here to say that I was raped by Theodore Jarrah's. When I was a little girl, I was living in Los Angeles. He was the district servant. There are two boys. Their initials are MD and MW. If they, I could find them, they, they're older than me. They were there. There were witnesses. We were terrified in the silence. We were not allowed to talk. My life was threatened. And my brothers were threatened. They were going to be killed. If I spoke, and when I started to remember the abuse, I was abused horrifically in the congregation, and I wrote the Watchtower Society, and I begged for help, and I have the letters with me to show you that they commended the elders who heard me, and they told me they could not answer any of the questions that I asked, nor could they comment on the circumstances which I described in the congregation. I ended up in the hospital in crisis in the emergency ward because of what the elders did to me, and then I was hospitalized for months because I had nowhere to go. I was homeless. They threw me out in the street. I was destitute and I was disabled. I was unable to work because of the flashbacks I was having. As we see, there was another victim of Jarich's rapping instincts. What called our attention was not only the fact that he raped another minor, but the threat and intimidation over the victims and witnesses to the crime. A typical Freemasonic tactic in order to silence the victims. It is quite normal to silence and punish the victims in case they keep talking inside Jehovah's Witnesses organization, mostly if the wrongdoer is a Freemason, which is the case in here. After repeated attempts to notify the service department in Brooklyn headquarters, her access was denied. Pat Garza was not disfellowshipped, however the service department, headed by Theodore Jarach himself had instructed her congregation to treat her like a disfellowshipped person by ignoring her in public and not speaking to her at the meetings. How inhuman! That happens mostly because the person she is accusing is a powerful Freemason. That might explain why her statement was removed from the website Silent Lambs, a web page specially dedicated to Jehovah's Witnesses who are victims of sexual abuse within the church. That also explains why many information about the involvement of Ted Jarach in pedophilia has been also removed from all over the internet. People can not know about it, no matter how true it is. The consequences of such cover-up have been disastrous both for Watchtower Society and for the individual Jehovah's Witnesses. Once Ted Jarach was himself a pedophilian, 
And at the same time the head of the service department he played an important role in designing the actual policy of Jehovah's Witnesses on child abuse matters. The two witness rule has been causing an internal division between high officials inside the Watchtower Society. The branches of Australia, Great Britain and France were not happy with the actual policy and were insisting with the governing body to depart from that rule. The handling of child abuse cases by the elders in each congregation is also bringing additional problems to the Watchtower. Despite that some body of elders being more attentive and applying some justice against sex molesters inside the congregations, with further disfellowshippings and reproof, most of the cases are not being reported to the police. Which means that Jehovah's Witnesses are failing to protect other children against such abuses. If we check the following documents we can see that it is registered as part of the elders' paperwork that most of the cases are not reported to the authorities, leaving the offender free to do it again with other children. This is part of the policy established by Theodore Jarach, a sex molester himself. Because of this the Watchtower Society has been spending dozens of millions of dollars in court settlements and penalty fines due to their mishandling of child abuse cases. Several letters and emails were sent by various journalists and TV stations regarding this matter, however nor the Watchtower Society, neither Ted Jarach himself gave any response. When inquired by the BBC by the end of a district convention in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Ted Jarach was poor in words and meaning. Just have a look. We'd been told we'd find a member of the governing body here. Ted Jarach is one of the men responsible for the church's child protection policy. For more than two months, we've been asking them for an interview. We want answers to some simple questions. Why do they keep their database of suspected paedophiles secret? Why don't they report all allegations of abuse to the police? Why do they send children back to the arms of their abusers? They refuse to talk to us, but here at last, we had our chance. Tell me about the database. How do you justify keeping a list of people, men in some cases, who have confessed to paedophilia, but you have not reported them to the authority? What justification is there for you, you know, to keep that you're list? Exactly. You have a privacy law. You have a directive from the European Union. You observe that, don't you? So when allegations well, of abuse are made, it's all right to keep them private? I think you were answered. That question was answered to your, should be to your satisfaction. Can you answer it now? I'm not going to repeat. I'll just tell you exactly that you can go and you see it in writing. It's all okay. You know, the Bible says, do not go beyond the things that are written. We don't go beyond the things that are written. And that was that. Let's move, let's move this way, please. No doubt, no second thoughts. Just a simple belief that Jehovah will sort it out. A belief for which others, younger and more vulnerable, may continue to pay a price. As we could hear and see with our own eyes, there was no statement of compassion for the victims. Nor any acknowledgement of any mistake or wrongdoing from the most powerful person ever in the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses organization. How much suffering could be avoided if this man wasn't in the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses? How much suffering, disgrace and public reproach could be avoided if him and others inside Jehovah's Witnesses leadership wasn't Freemasons? This is something to which the genuine Jehovah's must reflect before donating any money to their organization. Once most of that money has been spent on legal expenses and court settlements regarding this problem of child abuse scandals. <laughs>